This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks. So thank you for attending class this evening. I'm glad that you're here. And tonight we are going to be discussing um, respiration, in particular the respiratory system and uh, the understanding of internal and external respiration, ventilation, and, and how uh, we actually breathe and the processes that take place in the respiratory system. So what I'd like to do first is by starting off and showing you uh, a short video, just a little bit of a clip, but it's going to show you some pretty intense training as far as SEALs, the special forces, uh, underwater, their underwater training. And why would I show this to you all? Well, know that their, their pool comp, their underwater training um, is done in such a way that they are pushing their, um, their students, their people who are going through this program and uh, attempting to go through this program and complete it. <laughs> That's because really uh, a, a small percentage, like 30% actually complete the training um, and then 70% wash out literally and figuratively. Um, part of what they do as far as being in the water is that they're limiting, limiting the amount of oxygen that they have access to. Okay, so you see here that the uh, the dive the student here is going to be going into the water with with this gear with the scuba gear, but they're going to be having issues. So let's let's take a moment, and I'd like to just show you as far as a little bit share. We'll do this full screen, and just show you what's going on, and I'll describe a little bit to you what's going on. Yeah, it is unbelievable indeed. So in their second phase of training. Uh, You'll see here that they are underwater, they have instructors that are coming by, and they're messing with their gear. They're putting knots in their gear, uh, they're taking off their gear. They're, this gentleman on the floor of the, the pool, he doesn't have a face mask at this point in time. He's having to hold his breath for extended periods of time, and these students will have to hold their breath for extended periods of time as they're being tested. Yeah, it's some pretty crazy stuff indeed. And they have to be in control and they have to just make sure that they're not um, really panicking, right? You see that there, tumble them around, taking the mouthpieces out, their face masks, putting things in knots. They practice these drills together. Oh, you can hear it. Oh, that's cool. All right, cool. San Diego Bay turns into a combat training area for practicing underwater navigation. Yes, sir. The men are learning to use a specialized breathing apparatus, the Draker LAR-5. It's a closed circuit underwater breathing apparatus designed for use in clandestine military yeah. operations. In All right, so I just wanted to show you that briefly there, but understand that um, truly they are pushed to the limits and so I want to share with you a little bit regarding that. So they're pushed to the limits as far as being in that pool, um, being underwater, uh, having to hold their breath for long periods of time. And I'll tell you that it's not the lack of oxygen that's really um, stressing them out and wanting and really the desire for their body to want to surface, come to the surface and get air. It's really the buildup of carbon dioxide, of CO2 present within their body that is building up and building up to the point where they want to be able to exhale that and relieve that and then take in oxygen. But really the trigger for wanting to breathe is more of the buildup of CO2 and not the lack of oxygen, just so that you know that there. And uh, But it's uh, quite interesting. I mean, we've all at some point in time, I'm sure, uh, been in a pool and tried to, you know, hold our breath and see how long we could hold our breath in comparison to someone else, uh, a brother, a sister, family member, you know, whoever it may be, a friend. Um, yeah, crazy stuff. So yeah, and very interesting, right? So this pool comp training here, very interesting and uh, a very small percentage of the population can actually uh, successfully go through the SEAL tr training and program. And I'm glad that there are people that are able to do that for us. Now coming to, uh, first we're gonna start off with these respiratory notes. Uh, and you'll see here, let's see, what are these? This is just called, Respiration 2020 uh, Part 1. And so I can change it to res Respiration 2021 20, uh, Part 1. It's the same notes. And so you'll see here as far as um, specific events, and this, this four pages, Word document, uh, deals with the specific events that take place as far as respiration is concerned. So I figured we start off the class with this. 
we'll go into the PowerPoint and then we'll come back to the respiratory notes for uh, part two there also. Okay. And you'll see here that uh, ventilation, when you think of breathing, when you think of air coming in and out of your lungs and into your body, you're thinking of ventilation, okay? Pulmonary ventilation. Respiration, there can be external and internal respiration. So when you think external respiration, you need to be thinking of the fact that there is an interaction between uh, the lungs and the apparatus of the lungs and the structures of the lungs, in particular, the alveoli. And in lab this past uh, Monday there, we saw a model that represented the alveoli of the lungs. And you saw these little tiny sacs, <coughs> excuse me, where gas exchange occurs. So it's gas exchange occurring and taking place between diffusion of these gases moving from uh, the lungs to the cardiovascular system. So oxygen, you see here, is being loaded into the blood. Carbon dioxide, the waste gas, is being unloaded from the blood uh, to the alveoli so that we can uh, exhale that gas. So that's external respiration. This interaction again between the lungs and the blood. Now, gas transport takes place, and this is just a matter of that. Oxygen and CO2 are moving via the bloodstream, and in particular, their interaction with uh, the blood, the erythrocytes. And then also we have here internal respiration, where this is the interaction between the blood vessels, the capillaries, and the cells and tissues of the body, okay? So we're gonna have a situation where there's gonna be an exchange, there's gonna be diffusion of oxygen from the capillaries to the cells and uh, tissues of the body, and then the capillaries will receive the CO2, the waste gas, uh, from those cells and tissues of the body and send it to uh, the lungs, to the alveoli, for the exchange to take place as far as external respiration is concerned. So know that, really, you have to get these terms down. Knowing ventilation, pulmonary ventilation, it's the normal breathing, right? In and out of the lungs. External respiration, again, the interaction between the alveoli and the blood vessels, the capillaries that surround the alveoli. And then gas is being moved, CO2, oxygen, being moved throughout the blood to the tissues of the body, cells of the body, the tissues of the body. And then that internal respiration, that interaction between the alveoli of the lungs and the, uh, the not a, sorry, the inter internal respiration, the interaction between the blood vessels and the cells and tissues of the body, uh, offloading that oxygen to the cells and then receiving the waste gas, the CO2, okay? So these terms are very important. You'll see here that as far as how is the oxygen, how is the gases, how is the air entering into our uh, respiratory system? Let me just put on my fan for a moment. I'm getting warm, <laughs> excuse me. Okay, so there's something called Boyle's Law. And Boyle's Law says that uh, volume and pressure are inversely proportional. So meaning that if volume is high, pressure is low, right? So if the space is, the volume is a good, is larger, then the pressure will be decreased or lower. And if the volume has been decreased, the pressure within will be increased, okay? So volume is low, pressure is high, and the inverse, as far as volume is high, pressure is low, Boyle's Law. And so you'll see here that as volume increases, pressure decreases, as volume decreases, pressure increases. And so why would this be an issue? Well, this is an issue because we have gases moving from high pressure to low pressure, okay? And so what happens is that we have the atmospheric pressure, the pressure outside of our bodies, okay? Now, if that pressure is higher than the pressure that's present within our lungs, air will do what? Air will come in from high pressure in the atmosphere to low pressure within our lungs. So air will come in. It's as if it will be sucked in because air is going to move down this pressure gradient from high pressure to low pressure, all right? And think about this for a moment. When we inhale, right, and when we're just breathing, um, upon inhalation, 
aka also known as inspiration, our thoracic cavity gets larger. Okay, the uh, diaphragm uh, flattens. So the diaphragm is a um, kind of a curve shaped, a um, dome shaped, dome shaped better uh, muscle that when it it contracts, it flattens. And as it flattens, it will then increase the volume in the thoracic cavity, increase the volume in the lungs. And as such, the pressure will decrease. That pressure will be less than the atmospheric pressure around our bodies. And so air will want to what? Come into our respiratory system. Now, in the case of the second on the right-hand side there, you'll see volume decreases, then pressure increases. Well, <coughs> how does air exit from our respiratory system and from our lungs? Well, you'll see here that what will happen. So contraction, the diaphragm is, is flat. Relaxation, the diaphragm is curved, right? It's, it's dome-shaped. And so it's going to decrease the volume in the thoracic cavity, in the lungs. And as such, that pressure inside will increase. And that pressure within the lungs will be greater than the atmospheric pressure all around us. As such, where's the air going to go? From inside to out. Expiration, exhalation, same thing. Let me stop what I'm doing right now because that's a big comp concept to, to understand and to know. Okay. So, does anybody have any questions with that so far? Okay. That, that's, that's really, those are some pretty important statements that I made. First off, talking about ventilation, external respiration, transport of the gases, and then internal respiration, as well as the fact that you need to know that there's an inverse proportional relationship between volume and pressure. And it's because of changes in pressure that gases will enter into and out of the respiratory system. Does anybody have any questions regarding that so far? Okay, it's a little bit weird, it's a little bit strange, but this this is just how. Now, can you? So this is how it works, and understand that. Can you forcibly? Can you forcibly inhale? Absolutely, right. I, so I can. I can forcibly inhale. Can I forcibly exhale? Yes, right? But understand that, so inhalation, there's a process that takes place where muscles contract, right? The diaphragm contracts, the diaphragm goes from dome-shaped to flat, right? Increasing the, the uh, surface area and the, the volume present within the lungs and the thoracic cavity, as well as there are intercostal muscles. The external intercostal muscles also will contract. But as far as exhalation, air exiting, it's a matter of, a, it's a passive process. So muscles are just relaxing. But again, like I said, you could forcibly inhale, you could forcibly exhale. Deb, do you have a question or a comment? I do, I do. Um, can you hear me? Absolutely, I can. Okay. So my question is um, for people that have COPD, when the carbon dioxide is building up in the alveoli, is that kind of like the same instance that pressure is building up? Yeah, so what goes on with them also is that, so the trigger for them to breathe is not the buildup of CO2 because that's a normal um, scenario that goes on with them. So really it mm -hmm. is the lack of oxygen that really is one of the, is the, is the trigger for them as far as breathing is concerned. So those with COPD, it's a different situation. And at the end of the lecture, we're gonna be looking at some pathology and such, and we'll talk about that. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, yeah. But yeah, you're, you're, it, is, it is a different scenario indeed. And actually folks, so, so know that people that uh, suffer, with, suffer from COPD, um, a high percentage of it is because they are, were smokers, are smokers, were smokers, or, we're exposed to secondary smoke, right? So bad stuff, yeah, extremely sad. And I have to tell you that not only have I seen patients suffering with this, but I've seen family, older family members on my side and my wife's side of the family suffer from this as well as um, die as a result of lung cancer. And the culprit is smoking and such. So, oh my gosh, it's terrible, right? It's just, it's devastating and it's really difficult to see someone you love, you know, slowly uh, dying as a result of 
and having issues with, wow, Michelle, I'm sorry, that's terrible. Yeah, indeed, to see them dying and having issues with their ability to breathe. And so imagine this, folks, So, and, and I, I, I understand this and I, I've had uh, dreams where you have the, uh, and, I've, and I have uh, issues with, um, issues with confined spaces. And so even from when I was a little kid, I got uh, stuck under a bed. And so anyway, just, but um, when you're in an area where there's not a whole lot of air and you feel like you're, you know, the anxiety that can be a part of this and issues with breathing or, or having someone hold you under the water when you're not wanting to be under the water, right? Um, these are all anxiety producing. So folks that have issues with their ability to breathe, uh, you know, really like in nursing homes and such and hospitals, they have, they give them medications in order to, uh, anti-anxiety medications in order for them uh, to be able to handle uh, dealing with that. And it's just a horrible feeling, right? Terrible. All right, folks. So I'm going to, I'm going to hide everyone again and return back to sharing my camera with you all. All right. So we've get this here. So Boyle's Law there's an inverse, inverse proportional relationship between volume and pressure, okay? So let's move on here. So the alveoli, the alveoli are these sacs, these air sacs. And again, like I said, we saw them in, uh, in class. And actually, when we were in the first semester, let's go here. When we were in the first semester, as far as for uh, AMP, AMP1, um, when you were looking at uh, simple squamous epithelial tissue. So let's take a look here. Simple. And let's look. What you're seeing here as far as this example within the lungs is you're seeing, folks, that these are, this image right here, these are alveoli. And so you have simple squamous epithelial tissue present in the alveoli. And so in here, here you go right here, right? You're seeing it here, okay? So these are the air sacs. Here are the air sacs where gas exchange will occur between the alveoli and the capillaries that surround them, okay? Let's take a look at uh, alveoli. And so here, what we're looking at here, folks, so take a look at this here. So here you're seeing, right, that we have these capillaries surrounding these little bubbles, these little air sacs, okay? And so here we have uh, these, the air will enter in and there's gonna be an interaction between, a diffusion between, so here's another picture here. So you're seeing capillaries surrounding, right? And allowing for diffusion of gases. Here's another image. So you're seeing here the capillary bed surrounding. Can you please again, the pointer is small, thanks. Um, all right, so let me sh let's show you here. I'll make this bigger. Okay, so here you're seeing that we have these bronchioles, and so we have these terminal bronchioles, and then we have these respiratory bronchioles, and then in particular from there, it'll branch out into alveolar ducts, which are just tubes that will bring each individual alveoli, right, uh, the gases that are needed from the lungs to those areas where gas exchange will occur. So this is where external respiration takes place, okay? external respiration. And let me show you again as far as then just um, sharing with you the uh, simple squamous. So let's just take a look. Let's look here. Okay. No. Let's go back and let's just go like this. No. Nope. Sorry, folks, I'm just <laughs> kind of messing up here. Uh, if I save the image, there we go. And then I can expand it right here.
Yes, that's correct, Norma. Okay. So here, what you're seeing is that these lines are actually so this isn't so this isn't um, adipose tissue, fat cells. That's not what you're seeing here. What you're seeing are these simple squamous epithelium that make up the alveoli. Okay. These little bubbles of tissue, that's a good way to say it, these bubbles of tissue that are surrounded with, and you'll see that there are blood vessels that are covering these alveoli, which will in turn then allow for gas exchange to occur. So gases are present here, folks, right? So the gases are present from uh, the CO2 from the body, and then the oxygen that comes in through the atmospheric uh, gases that we're breathing in, the air that we breathe in, okay? All right. Okay. So here's a, here's another. Uh, well, let's see here. And let me just show you this image here because this is interesting for you to see. And so when you were thinking of a patient who has an infection, right, within their lungs, really know that like where where would anything that comes in go out if it's if it's a solid or liquid or it's as a result of some type of infection that's taking place within, it's only gonna go in one way, right? So as a result, really, so normal healthy bronchial and alveoli, you'll see that there are, you know, it's moisture in here. There's a chemical called surfactant. It's a lipid that helps to uh, allow for, it decreases surface tension and it allows for those tissues, those little bubbles of tissue to stay open and inflated. Um, a baby that's born, prior to six months, they have issues with the six months and before, they have issues with their body not producing surfactant, right? And so it has, they have a lot of difficulty as far as breathing on their own. You'll see here, as far as uh, lung infection, accumulation of fluid in the alveoli, uh, thickened alveolar wall, so there's inflammation going on, as well as infection and fluid, and this is not a good scenario for gas exchange to take place within the lungs. So let's move on here. So I've already mentioned to you regarding simple squamous epithelium. These line the alveolar walls. They have, they really are what comprise the primary cells of the alveolar walls. There are pores. These pores connect the adjacent alveoli, right? They connect, they're, they're all connected by these little pores that are present between, okay? Uh, capillaries cover the external surface of the alveoli, allowing for diffusion of the gases, O2 out, CO2 in, so that we can then exhale and get that out of the body, right? Uh, let's see here. So again, I said to you about diffusion. I talked to you about oxygen and CO2. Uh, know that also, see here, as far as there are macrophages, or they're called dust cells that are present and they add protection and they're part of the immune response in order to pick up bacteria, carbon uh, particles and other debris and kind of like really, again, to know that the macrophages, they're the cleanup crew of the body. And so they'll process and recycle whatever is taking place within the body that they can take care of. Um, I mentioned to you about surfactant and how important this is to allow for those little uh, bubbles of tissue to stay open, right? And and not to collapse upon themselves, okay? So ventilation, pulmonary ventilation. So the uh, how air enters in and out of the lungs, okay? So let's look on the right-hand side first. So again, it's that pressure volume relationship, Boyle's law, okay? And terms that we can use, inspiration is also known as inhalation. Expiration is also known as exhalation. So we can use them interchangeably, okay? And you'll see here that when there is contraction of the diaphragm, as well as uh, the external um, intercostal muscles, the muscles between the ribs, right? As far as contraction is concerned, that will enable the volume present within the lungs to increase. As a result, the pressure will decrease and it'll be less than the air, The the atmospheric air, right? The atmospheric and the pressure within. So that pressure is greater. So we move the gases from high pressure to low pressure. So air will move into 
the respiratory system. Now, upon relaxation of the musculature, the volume will decrease. And then as such, the pressure will increase. It'll be greater than the atmospheric pressure. So what's gonna to happen to the air? It will exit the respiratory system and go out of the body, okay? Inspiration, expiration, inhalation, exhalation. That's ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation. So just as a review, you're seeing here, completely mechanical process that depends on volume changes in the thoracic cavity. Volume changes lead to pressure changes, which lead to the flow of gases to equalize the pressure. Now, how about this? If there is an equal pressure, from, so say we have 760 outside and 760 inside, is there gonna be a movement of air? No, there's been an equalization of pressure. But really, we need to breathe, right? So we're going to we're going to have this constant process take place until the day that we we pass on, um, where there will be pressure and volume changes. Okay. All right. We've talked about the phases. We've talked about what's taking place. I've mentioned to you that it's not only the diaphragm that contracts, but it's also those external intercostal muscles, right? The muscles that when you're eating ribs, when you're eating pork or barbecue ribs, this is what you're eating, folks, intercostal muscles, as well as other muscles that are attached to, right? Um, and you'll see here as far as, so inspiration air is sucked in as a result of pressure changes and expiration, there, it's a passive process, muscles relax, air is pushed out as a result of pressure changes. And so, yes, can you have forced inspiration, forced expiration as a result of recruiting and consciously thinking about <sighs> inhale, exhale. Yes, that's all part of it, indeed. And it's diffusion of these gases, movement from high concentration to low concentration, right? Now that external respiration, we've talked about this and we said that external respiration, it's the interaction between uh, the, the gases within the alveoli and the uh, blood vessels, the capillaries that are surrounding those alveoli, right? Now, know this here, oxygen is loaded into the blood and unloaded out of the blood. That's the terms that we use to describe this as far as the movement of oxygen into the blood, the movement of CO2 out of the blood, okay? Um, know this also that the alveoli always have more oxygen than the blood, okay? So oxygen is moving by diffusion from an area of lower concentration, right? Towards, towards the area, sorry, towards the area of lower concentration. So from high concentration within the alveoli to lower concentration within the blood vessels, right? From high to low, it's diffusion. Okay? Pulmonary capillary blood gains oxygen. And the opposite occurs as far as then when we have, when we unload the, the blood, and take that CO2 and allow it to go enter into the alveoli, which will in turn be leave the body via exhalation, also known as expiration, okay? This is that external respiration, that movement of the gases between the alveoli and the blood vessels. Next, we talk about gas transport. There we go. Okay. And so we need to uh, move oxygen. We need to move CO2 in the blood and, and know that really primarily oxygen is being carried uh, via the red blood cells, the erythrocytes. Okay. Uh, oxygen travels attached to hemoglobin, right? This protein present within the erythrocytes. And really when you think of an erythrocyte, it's not a complete cell in that, you know, there's no nucleus present, right? So we have, it's a nucleate and it has it's like, we consider it like a sack of hemoglobin, really. And in that hemoglobin, there's iron present, right? And that it enables, it gives it the ability to attach and carry oxygen. And so we call that when it's carrying it, oxyhemoglobin. Small dissolved amount is carried in the plasma. So yes, within the liquid portion of the blood, yes, some of the oxygen is carried, but primarily it's on, it's attached to the hemoglobin in the erythrocytes. CO2 transport. So. Know that really 
not a whole lot of it's, and we saw this when we were talking, when we were looking at the blood there, that only a small percentage is actually carried uh, via the erythrocytes. So most of the carbon dioxide is transported in the plasma as bicarbonate, okay? And a small amount is carried inside the red blood cells as uh, carbamino hemoglobin, okay? Um, but different, but at different binding sites than those for oxygen. Recall also that we mentioned, uh, just to remind you all that um, C, O, right, carbon monoxide, um, has the ability to take the binding sites where oxygen would bind to uh, hemoglobin, and as such, there's a greater affinity for it to attach to, connect to uh, carbon monoxide than oxygen, and as such, this is what contributes to uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, terrible stuff. You'll see here as far as, now look at this here, for CO2 to diffuse out of the blood and into the alveoli, uh, it must be released from its bicarbonate form. So bicarbonate ions enter the red blood cell, combine, so, so you'll see here that even though the majority of CO2 is not carried by the erythrocytes, it's st we still need the erythrocytes in order to uh, take them from the bicarbonate form, traveling in the plasma, to then CO2, being uh, released into the alveoli. So bicarbonate ions enter the red blood cell, combine with hydrogen ions, form carbonic acid. So we go from HCO3, negatively charged, right, an anion, to H2CO3, the carbonic acid. Carbonic acid splits to form water and CO2. And so carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood into the alveoli, and then it's let off to go during expiration. Internal respiration, right? So what is different here? So it's just a matter of that. We have the movement of the uh, oxygen to the cells of the tissues of the body, and we're receiving, the blood is receiving the CO2, the waste gas, right? So exchange of gases between blood and the body cells. Opposite reaction that occurs within the lungs on external respiration. So carbon dioxide diffuses out of tissue cells to the blood, right? That's called loading. So we're loading the carbon dioxide into the blood. We're unloading the oxygen from the blood into the cells and tissues, right? And so that's, you need to just know those terms down cold and understand the processes and really just, you know, study these, uh, this one note packet here, these four uh, pages of this Word document, please. Now, let's look at, we're going to go to the, uh, to the PowerPoint. I'll stop for a moment here and just uh, touch base with you all and just see if we have any. Yes, and uh, alveoli involved in pneumothorax. So what's going on with that is a little bit of a different situation there, Ruth, as far as when we have uh, that's going on where there's extra air in the area. And so it's not allowing for the actual um, lungs to inflate properly, okay? So let's move on here. I'm going to go here and let's, so we're gonna look at in this second, um, so the second Word document in a few minutes here, we'll look at that after we're looking at the PowerPoint for a bit. And what you'll see there is we're gonna be talking about some different types of uh, situations as far as pathology is concerned. So we'll, we'll hold off on that until the end, okay? So let me minimize that. Let's go to the PowerPoint here. And so start the presentation here. And so folks, we know that, right? So we know that uh, the different structures and such, and so you will have to, um, and those that were in lab on Monday saw that we went over and we discussed uh, and really kind of finished up as far as the sagittal head is concerned. We looked at respiratory structures as well as digestive structures of the sagittal head. And so that'll be on, again, that will that will continually be on the practicals that we're going over. Just you're learning more and more as far as now we've finished up uh, respiratory and digestive for the sagittal head, and that'll be on practical number two. Well, um, also we're talking about the pharynx, which is the throat, uh, the voice box, which is the larynx, uh, trachea, the bronchi, those large tubes, that these gases will enter into the lungs via those tubes, okay? 
And we talked about the interaction between the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. So here you're just taking a look at it and seeing as far as, so I think what's pretty cool is that if you were to uh, turn this structure upside down and have the trachea, imagine the trachea being like a tree trunk and then the branches being all of the different tubes from the bronchi to the primary, secondary, tertiary bronchi, and then to the bronchioles, the little tiny vessels, the tiny um, structures, these tubes, these ducts that are present here, and bringing the air then to uh, those alveoli for gas exchange to occur. And what you're not seeing here, folks, is you're seeing the um, little spaces and these little pockets of bubbles of tissue, but you're not seeing uh, the covering of the blood vessels of the capillaries surrounding those uh, alveoli. And here uh, in the lab, we're looking at and going over, looking at the external nares, the vestibule, the uh, nasal cavity. Here's the opening for the eustachian tube, the superior, middle, and inferior um, nasal concha, the holes that are present within here, also the uh, superior, middle, and inferior nasal um, meatuses, okay, which are also present. The um, hard palate, the soft palate, the uvula, right? Uh, the palatine tonsil. Here's the pharyngeal tonsil. Pharyngeal tonsil. You're thinking of the adenoids. The palatine tonsil. You're thinking of your. Someone says my tonsils are swollen. That's what they're talking about. The palatine, right? Uh, you'll also see here at the base of the tongue. So here's the tongue. You're seeing here the lingual tonsil. Here you're seeing the epiglottis which protects the respiratory system from liquids and food entering into it, particulate matter. And you'll see here that we have the naso, oro, and laryngeo uh, pharynx, the port parts of the throat, okay? You're seeing here sinuses as far as sphenoid and frontal sinuses present. And then you're also seeing here as far as these vocal folds, the false and the true vocal folds that are present and allow for as air passes through them, the production of speech, phonation, right? The production of speech. And then you're also seeing here as far as different cartilages that are present, okay? So uh, you're seeing here thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage and the glottis. So the glottis is the opening. So the vocal folds, right? So they stay closed. And when they open, that creates that opening is the glottis. So the epiglottis covers that, protects that. Um, um, please, somebody say to me that you were able to hear the uh, the video. Did you hear the actual video feed? You were able to hear the volume. Someone just remind me of that. That was everybody able to hear that volume from the video. Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So then I'm going to play a cool video for you all. So I think you'll find this interesting. So let me uh, minimize this for a moment, and I'll show you quite a cool video regarding the glottis and uh, the voice box and such. So let's close up some, very good. All right, let's see here. And let's go here and let's go back out and let's go to, And I play this each semester, and I think it's uh, pretty cool to be able to see. Let's see. I'll find the video. Ah, <laughs> and it's when you want to show it, that's when you can't find it, right? Okay. Let's see here. Ah, I can't believe it. Yes. I hope they didn't move it. Let's see. Oh, I'm really frustrated if I can't find that. That's crazy. I'm sorry, folks. Just bear with me for a moment because it's really quite cool, actually, to be able to see. And... 
I could play another video, but I just really like this one. Yeah, darn it. Okay. Uh, All right, so I, what I'm going to do, I'm sorry, I'm just going to, I'm going to post then, I'm going to let you listen to this gentleman who really is a, a vocal coach and really knows what he's talking about. Let me just go down for a moment to see. Oh, poop. All right, it's okay. I'll find it and I'll share it with you all next time. Okay, let's see here, let's come back up. All right, let's listen to this gentleman. And actually, this gentleman has quite an interesting voice himself when he's talking. So listen to what he has to say for a few minutes. Here. I hope you don't get queasy. I'm going to show you live video of a singer's vocal cords as she sings. You may want to sit down. I am Chuck Gilmore with power to sing. Many students feel singing is a great mystery. They don't understand how their voice works, why it works the way it does, and what's involved with singing. It all begins with the vocal cords. Specialists look at your vocal cords with a flexible or a rigid scope. The flexible scope is a small cord with a camera at the end of it. It's inserted through the nose and extended down the throat to see the vocal cords. The rigid scope is like a large pen with a camera at the end. It's used looking into the mouth and throat. Both images look like this. This can be confusing because the vocal cords are horizontal in the throat like this. They are not vertical like this. When the scope sees the cords and projects it on a monitor, they look like they're vertical or up and down. Vocal cord. And so know that folks. So look at this right here. So this would be the epiglottis right here. This is the epiglottis, and here you're seeing the folds, the vocal cords. Sometimes called vocal folds are located in the mid portion of your neck, about halfway down, between the top and the bottom of your neck. There are two vocal cords, and they're, <laughs> they're connected in the front of your neck and open and close in the back, towards the back of your neck. They're located inside the voice box or larynx. The cords sit at the top of your windpipe or trachea. Men can feel the top of their voice box, often called the Adam's apple. Women have the same thing. Which is called the laryngeal prominence that you'll have to know and live. But it's smaller and harder to feel with your finger. Your vocal cords are just behind the Adam's apple. Now, women can sometimes feel their Adam's apple by placing their finger here and gently pushing in on their neck. And about the first lump that you feel is the top of the larynx. About halfway down your neck, you feel that small bump. That's your Adam's apple, ladies. And your vocal cords are just behind it. I can feel a small V right in the center of the top of my Adam's apple. That's cardinal. Now, and that's this right now. Yeah. cords about the same length. But birth are vocal cords about the same length. So your laryngeal prominence is right here. Okay. Now at birth, our vocal cords are about the same length, approximately two millimeters. By age 20, women's cords are about 10 millimeters and men's 60 millimeters in length. The change for men is much greater, and this causes a deepening of the voice and can make singing during the vocal change much harder. Vocal cords are tissue and are three-dimensional. That means they have length, width and depth. Just like other tissue in your body, there are different layers of tissue. Vocal cords have three primary layers, muscle, ligament, and mucosa. It's the slick outer layer of uh, vocal cords. <laughs> That's funny, vocal Norma. Cords <laughs> come together to make noise with their voices and are covered up when they swallow. A type of lid called the epiglottis closes over the vocal cords when we swallow. Sometimes fluid gets through. We cough. <laughs> the 
clear it out. When air passes through our vocal cords as we speak or sing, they create a series of sound waves, which we can hear. This series of sound waves we call vibration. The vocal cords create the initial vibrations, which is the initial tones we hear that begin the sound we make, speaking and singing. Now watch and listen as these vocal cords create the vibrations that become our voices. <laughs> pretty cool, right, folks? That's a uh, pretty neat stuff. I hope you enjoyed that. I thought I think that's uh, very fascinating to be able to actually view that and look at that there. Yeah, cool. I'm glad that you enjoyed that. So let's move on uh, in our PowerPoint presentation here, and uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time because we're just going to kind of breeze through a bit regarding uh, the anatomy and such. And so you'll see here, as far as that, uh, there are um, coarse hairs present within uh, the vestibule. So the, I, I try to explain to students that the vestibule is the area within the nasal cavity, right, that you can actually put your finger in. That's the vestibule, okay? Um, anything further than that, and then it's just part of the nasal cavity, and you'll see the concha and such, okay? But there are hairs present that will filter large dust particles, so they're acting as a filter, okay? Uh, you'll see here as far as that uh, these... Um, Concha and then the openings, right, are present present within uh, the olfactory receptors are present in the superior aspect of the nasal cavity, and so then we have here as far as the function of the nasal cavity: warm and moisturize the air, as well as for your sense of smell, olfaction, and as well as also contributing to. So your sinuses will contribute to the resonance of your voice and voice production and such. So we all know that when, we have, when we're congested in our sinuses uh, and there could be a possible infection, you're gonna have more of a nose, nasal type of uh, Whereas without that, you know, there's a different, uh, your speech changes uh, and the sound of your speech changes as a result of uh, not having an infection as well as in, in comparison to having an infection and uh, liquid present within the sinuses. Uh, You'll see here as far as for the pharynx, right? These are this not really difficult as far as understanding that. Uh, the throat allows for food and liquid to pass through, air to pass through, and also creating this resonant, resonating chamber uh, for your ability to speak and such. I mentioned to you these divisions as far as the naso, oro, and laryngeal pharynx associated with these specific areas. Let's see, I can show you. All right, let me just show you an image that might be helpful also. So an image like this would be, oh, there we go, this one. This is a good image that can help you regarding uh, looking at the sagittal section of the head and seeing here that the nasopharynx, right, from the... Uh, really from the, the area right here where we have uh, the adenoids, the pharyngeal tonsil, uh, to the uh, uvula, and then from the uvula uh, to the tip of the epiglottis right here, oropharynx, and then from this region right here to distal to the very beginning of the esophagus would be the laryngeal pharynx. Okay, so we have three parts of the throat, and those are the terms that we use to describe it. and the cartilages and such. So I've mentioned to you these cartilages in lab. We know the thyroid cartilage, we've seen that in the lab before, right? It's the largest of the cartilages. The epiglottis, that's that flap that will protect and prevent food and liquids from entering into the trachea. The cricoid cartilage is larger in the posterior and it's smaller in the anterior. And you'll see that in the, the model in the lab. 
and the arytenoid and the corniculate cartilage. Uh, the arytenoid cartilage is larger, the corniculate cartilage is really at the little tips of the arytenoid cartilage. Mucous membranes are present um, and allowing for then these folds, right, these false and true vocal folds or cords, right, they, there should be, they should be moist, they should not be dry. That's important. And so really with a mucous membrane, a mucous area, there's going to be this mucus present, this sticky substance that will be present that will contribute to uh, the moisture as well as contributing to uh, the ability to attract particulate matter so that it doesn't enter deep within uh, the, the lungs and such and then is able to then end up into the uh, digestive system. The glottis I mentioned to you is an opening, it's a hole and sound is produced by vibrating those vocal folds. And here we have, when you're looking at the sagittal section you're seeing here of the head, you're seeing the false vocal fold or cord, and then you're seeing the true vocal fold or cord that is inferior to the false vocal fold. You're seeing here that the large thyroid cartilage, the smaller cricoid cartilage in the anterior, it's just the term that they use to describe them because they are not really producing sound, okay? So they're not involved in sound production and phonation. Only the true vocal folds or cords are uh, regarding that. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Cricoid cartilage, again, larger in the posterior, smaller in the anterior, and you're seeing here that the tracheal cartilage, okay? of the trachea. And so we looked at this in the lab. You'll see right here, this is that laryngeal prominence. The Adam's apple is right here. Oh, and by the way, also, so you're seeing here that the corniculate cartilage, the arytenoid cartilage, actively involved in uh, contributing to the opening of the vocal folds and such and production of sound. One more thing that I didn't mention to you is that, see how the tracheal rings? They don't create a full ring right? It's like a two-thirds of a ring, and that you'll see here that because what's going to be adjacent to uh, this membrane of the trachea would be the esophagus, right? It's going to be right posterior to that, and if the, so imagine if something gets stuck in the, if some type of material gets stuck within the esophagus, the esophagus needs to be able to expand a bit, and so if this were rigid in the posterior, it wouldn't allow for any expansion of the esophagus and can really create major problems for the patient. Okay, let's see here, okay. And as we just look here and just see that we have, and so I'm just gonna review this with you all as far as I, and I did this in lab and I'll do this again. So the trachea is the, is the, the tube which we have the air entering into the respiratory system, okay? And what will happen is that this area is called the corinna. This is where we have the bifurcation. We have a primary bronchus here and here. Each primary bronchi will send air to each lung, okay? Now the lungs are broken, are separated by, on the left-hand side, we have two lobes, and on the right-hand side, we have three lobes. And so the secondary bronchi uh, bring lungs to, secondary, bronchi, secondary bronchus will bring lungs to bring air to the lobes of the lung. Sorry about that, okay. So secondary bronchi bring air to each lobe of the lungs on each side. So there'll be three secondary bronchi on the right and two on the left. And then the tertiary bronchi will bring uh, air to the segments of the lobes. So let's just show you, let's see, yeah. Let me just show you here as far as uh, segments of the lungs are concerned. And I'm not asking you to memorize the lung segments. So let's just take a look at, you know, let's take a look at this image. So you'll see here, as far as these all tertiary bronchi are bringing air to each of the segments in different colors 
of the lung. So we have here superior, middle, and inferior uh, lobes, and then they are broken down into superior, anterior, basal, um, lateral. Um, you'll see here medial and lateral. You'll see here for the uh, middle lobe, as far as the upper lobe, apical, anterior, and posterior. So you see how they're broken down into segments. Those tertiary bronchi bring air to those individual segments of the lobes. And you'll see here as far as the oblique and horizontal fissures right? that you'll have to be able to identify in the lab. Okay, and then you're also seeing here, and I did mention to this to you, as far as then these terminal bronchi bronchioles, which will then, then go into these uh, uh, respiratory bronchioles, and then in particular, then you'll have these alveolar ducts, so it goes terminal, respiratory, bronchioles, and then it goes even further distal, as far as the alveolar ducts are these tubes that are bringing uh, air to these alveoli, okay? And here you're just seeing the lobes and the brachial tree, the bronchial tree. All right, and we talked about that already, and that. Now, as far as coverings of the lungs, so the parietal pleura, the visceral pleura, know that the visceral pleura has direct contact, this connective tissue, with the viscera, with the lungs themselves. Uh, the pleural cavity is the area um, between, okay? And so you have the parietal pleura, the visceral pleura, that cavity in between, and this allows for then the lungs to expand and to contract, to contract and to expand, to relax, and to have movement taking place without the buildup of friction. If you do this with your hands, what can you feel? You can feel heat, right? You can feel warmth because that's friction building up. Um, we don't want to have that, and so we also have um, fluid present within, so a little bit of fluid that allows for then these tissues to move and these connective tissues to cover and protect and allow for movement of the organs without the buildup of friction of heat, okay? An inflammation of the parietal pleura uh, is pleurisy and that can be a painful condition. Let's see here, we talked about that. Uh, this surfactant, okay? Um, you'll see here as far as the alveoli, they're covered in with inside, with inside of them, with this uh, lipid, this surfactant, which helps to reduce surface tension and allow for these capillary, these little, sorry, these alveoli, these little uh, bubbles of tissue to stay inflated. We talked about this already. You can review that in the PowerPoint here. And this is just going over and showing you regarding um, ventilation external, internal um, respiration, as well as, as well as uh, gas, gas movement in the blood, okay? Now we're gonna look at capacities and such. So yeah, so I'm gonna exit out of the PowerPoint. I'm going to go back to then, I'm gonna go to the respiratory notes part two, and I'm going to take about a three minute break, folks. So we're gonna do about a three minute break, just uh, real quick, I'll, going to stop sharing my camera. I'll, well, I'll just cover my camera, but you'll still have this to look at. And if you haven't um, put this on your laptop or anything just yet, go into documents and resources and you'll see respiratory notes one and two. So give me about three minutes. I'll be right back and I'll see you in just a couple minutes.
We'll start in just one moment, folks. Give me just one moment. All right, folks. So let's uh, let's continue on here, please, and we'll uh, finish up our uh, lecture for tonight there regarding the respiratory system. So there are volumes that can be measured, okay? And this is to figure out and determine as far as the uh, the the, capa the functional capacity and and how uh, the respiratory system is is functioning and working. And so we'll have here as far as this tidal volume. So I want you to know the term tidal volume because this deals with pulmonary ventilation, the disactive normal breathing of air entering in and exit, so in and out of the air, right, for inspiration and expiration. That has a, a volume that can be measured, okay? The air inspiratory reserve, the forcibly uh, air taken in over this tidal volume, okay? So we can actually, Right, so that we, we would measure as approximate 3,100 uh, milliliters as far as expiratory reserve, right? So air forcibly exhaled after uh, tidal expiration, right? So we have just regular expiration as far as the tidal volume, and then the air that we can forcibly exhale out of our lungs, and then the residual volume, folks. So know that there's air remaining after expiration allows for gas exchange to continually go on no matter whether, whether we're breathing in or out, right? There's still, there's always going to be gas exchange taking place throughout the whole act of uh, inspiration and expiration, okay? And it also uh, enables, right, this residual volume, uh, air remaining present within uh, the lungs, uh, allows for the alveoli to can keep open, to be inflated, all right? So you see here that the expiratory reserve and the residual volume, uh, they're pretty much approximately the same, okay? Um, air that reaches the respiratory zone. So think about this for a moment, right? This functional volume. This is the air that's actually involved in the alveoli themselves and where gas exchange is occurring, okay? And then dead space. So, so know this, right? That in the dead space, there's air present within the different tubes, the bronchi and such, and also the trachea, that there's no conduction, there's no movement of diffusion of gases. And so this is air that doesn't reach the alveoli, that's not present within the alveoli, right, to allow for then gas exchange to occur, okay? And you'll see here that these capacities, capacities, vital capacity, is comprised of these different volumes. Okay, uh, let me move this up here. Here we go. And you'll see here that there are non-respiratory air movement or gas movements. We cough, we sneeze, we cry, we laugh, we hiccup, we yawn. These are all aspects of air is moving as a result of these uh, different types of actions that we do. Here's just giving you a little bit regarding the volumes and the capacities that are present. And just know that total lung capacity uh, comprises um, all of the different volumes, okay? All together, all combined. Sounds that can be uh, produced, right? So two recognizable sounds produced uh, upon auscultation. If I'm auscultating a patient, I'm listening to what's going on with their body, whether I'm auscultating the heart or I'm auscultating for blood pressure or for uh, what's going on as far as uh, the uh, respiratory sounds or the bowel sounds in the digestive system. You're gonna hear cool stuff. So I highly recommend by getting a stethoscope, getting a sphygmo mammometer and uh, practicing blood, taking blood pressure on your family and on your friends, as well as listening to uh, the lungs, listening to the uh, abdominal sounds that are that can be present you'll hear some pretty interesting noises for sure and you'll see here that uh, bronchial sounds air is being rushed through large passageways right so like the trachea and the bronchi that produces bronchial sounds that's a different sound from these vesicular sounds 
by the soft sounds of air filling the alveoli, which would be more distal instead of more proximal to uh, the mediastinum and to the uh, hilum of the lungs, okay? As far as neural regulation is concerned, right? So you'll see here, as far as that, uh, the medulla oblongata in conjunction with the pons, very important as far as maintaining the rate and rhythm of uh, your ability to breathe. Um, normal respiratory rate, we would say this normal, right? So eupnea, all right? Uh, apnea would be the, the absence of breathing. Eupnea is normal breathing, okay? So 12 to 15 respirations per minute, okay? You'll see here newborns, look at how their respirations, 40 to 80 respirations per minute. And as we develop and, and mature, uh, those amount of respirations decrease as far as how many we have per minute, okay? Uh, what else here as far as, what was that term? Say say again, Norma. Ask me it again. The term eupnea. Yeah, apnea is the, so like you've heard the term sleep apnea. So this is the cessation, the stoppage of breathing while you're sleeping, apnea. So it's a stoppage of ble breathing, of breathing. Apnea, eupnea, normal breathing. Now the term hyperpnea, right? So this is anything, you're welcome. So this is anything that's hyper, hyper would be, so it would be accelerated, it would be increased. So increased respiratory rate, often due to extra oxygen needs. How about if you're exercising, are you gonna have hyperpnea? Absolutely, right? Uh, and you'll see here, as far as oxygen and CO2 levels, so again, to know that oxygen is the stimulus for those whose systems have been accustomed to high levels of CO2 and low levels of oxygen present, okay? So in the case of, like we said, as far as COPD is concerned, okay? Um, you'll see here as far as rhinitis is concerned, so it's an inflammation of nasal mucosa, right? And so there's some type of infection taking place. Could it be uh, fungal? Could it be um, Bacterial, could it be viral? Uh, laryngitis, again, issues with the larynx and issues with the, uh, so how about the throat would be what? A pharyngitis. And we talked about pharyngitis as far as uh, the infection that could take place within the throat that could travel via that opening of the eustachian tube into the nasal cavity. And especially for those that are younger can enter into then the middle ear as a result of the eustachian tube. Ah, that's terrible, right? Yeah, that's really can be brutal having laryngitis. And you have to be careful, really, that you don't you don't um, damage the vocal cords, the vocal folds. Now, smoking. So here, let's take a look here. Inhibits and ultimately destroys cilia, okay? Yeah, indeed, Kyle, that's right. Um, you'll see here, as far as smoking is concerned, right? It, de it destroys the cilia that are present in the uh, tissues of the respiratory tract, okay? So you're thinking of like um, uh, pseudostratified uh, epithelial tissue with cilia, and they are present with cilia so that they can actually, in combination with the mucus, right, that's being produced, uh, attach to, connect to particulate matter that enters into your respiratory tract and move it outside of the body or move it into the digestive tract and have your stomach process that, okay? So what goes on is that when some a patient smokes, um, they wake up in the morning and they're coughing, okay? And what happens is that over a period of time that because of they're not smoking, their cilia actually start to wake up and, and are be able to function in order to move the particulate matter with the, with the mucus out of the, out of the respiratory system. But what happens then is that what does a patient do to stop coughing? They start smoking, they start smoking again, and that deadens, that really anesthetizes the cilia and stops them from functioning. So without ciliary activity, coughing is the only way to prevent mucus from accumulating in the lungs. Uh, this is the reason why smokers with respiratory congestion should avoid medications that inhibit the cough reflex. So, you know, in case of, so again, too, we said about cough medicine and how this over-the-counter medicine can really affect, it's not affecting the pharynx, the throat, right? It's affecting your medulla oblongata, folks, which also has other issues regarding your ability to uh, maintain your heart rate and your blood pressure 
right? So really very important. Folks, look at this, what you're seeing here. Wow, if that isn't, if that picture doesn't say a thousand words, right? Uh, as far as from a smoker and a non-smoker, the lungs, that's uh, quite remarkable. The Heimlich maneuver. So this is something important regarding that can the, yeah, it is Kyle, indeed, I agree. You'll see here, as far as the uh, Heimlich maneuver is helping patients that are choking, okay? They can't speak or cough. There's no air coming out. And as such, then you know that, yes, so this is a universal sign of choking and we need to do something in order to help remove that blockage so that they can breathe again. Putting the thumb side of your fist up against and right inferior to, right at really the xiphoid process. You're taking your other hand coming around and you're going to go in and up, right? And trying to do what you can, quickly thrust upward and inward into the person's belly, right? Right inferior to the xiphoid process. Repeat it several times until the choking object comes loose, right? So really pretty uh, scary. And you really should all, you you know, even you're getting into healthcare and if you don't already know CPR and know basic first aid, you should be taking a class in order to know that. Because, you know, getting into different medical programs, you will have to be certified with that. And so that's a tracheal obstruction and Heimlich maneuver. Now, yeah, good. Yeah, very good, Kyle, and important for you to do that for sure. Uh, let's see here. So COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, right? So we're looking, it's a combination of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. And so with chronic bronchitis, you'll see here, so let's look down here. So bronchitis, we have these, uh, the bronchi, right? So here's healthy, normal. Oh, golly, right? Look at this. We have excess mucus. We have inflammation of the tissues. We have a decrease in the lumen, right? Where gas, where air should be passing through. Look at that, right? That's really trouble. Muscle contraction. So we really have issues um, and an infection, chronic infection, chronic inflammation, chronic bronchitis, emphysema. So you'll see here, here are those healthy alveoli, these little sacs, these air sacs. Well, in emphysema, the walls of the air sacs break down and are destroyed. And as such, we have larger areas, larger spaces, and there's less gas exchange occurring. That's not a good thing. Weight loss, wheezing chronic dyspnea. Dyspnea means difficulty breathing. Dyspnea means difficulty breathing. Cough and sputum. So you're having, you're spitting up, uh, you know, it's a productive type of a cough. You're spitting up mucus and whatever other secretions, as well as chest tightness. These are all as a result of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. You'll see here that in emphysema, there's an issue as far as in exhaling what's present within the lungs. All right, so chronic inflammation, uh, lung fibrosis, loose, loss of elasticity, um, the breakdown of tissue, the destruction of tissue of the alveoli, large amount of energy to exhale. It becomes an active process, whereas normal breathing, right? Normal ventilation, inhale, exhale, exhalation, a passive process. It becomes an active process in emphysema. There's an overinflation of the lungs leading to this barrel chest for those that uh, deal with and suffer with emphysema. Terrible illness, folks, terrible. Lung cancer, there are different types of etiologies for lung cancer. Know that really lung cancer is an aggressive form of cancer um, and really smoking is just one of the major contributing factors to uh, lung cancer. As far as uh, uh, infant respiratory uh, distress syndrome, ERDS, right? Um, this is as a result of, right, that uh, surfactant is formed late in pregnancy, around 28 to 30 weeks of pregnancy. If a child is born prior to that and their body is not secreting and producing the surfactant, this is a problem as far as leading to the inability for their alveoli to stay inflated and allow for gas, gas exchange to occur. Okay. Uh, SIDS. Uh, sudden infant death syndrome. We know this. We've heard about this before. Um, uh, apparently, a healthy infant stops breathing and dies during their sleep. 
Um, possible etiology could be as a result of uh, issues with the nervous system and the respiratory system working in conjunction together and having issues as well as genetics, um, heart rhythm abnormalities. These are all possible etiologies for SIDS and a very, very extremely sad uh, situation. <coughs> Excuse me. Asthma. So there's a chronic inflamed hypersensitivity here. So take a look at here, folks. We have very similar to what's taking place as far as with um, bronchitis, but looking more at the bronchioles, right? And uh, so you'll see here as far as normal bronchial tube, and then with inflamed bronchial tube of an asthmatic. So we have this inflammation, we have this swelling, we have this excessive uh, mucus, and so difficulty in uh, periods of time of, of breathing and such, these asthma attacks. And that's it as far as our notes here for today. All right, so let's stop recording. <laughs>